Hi, I'm Simon Bestwick, and I'm here to read a short story uh, that I've written, LGBTQ Awareness Month. This story has appeared on the uh, Ginger Nuts of Horror website as of Monday, um, and owes its existence really to James Bennett. Um, James was probably the main mover in suggesting to Jim McLeod at Ginger Nuts of Horror that he do um, something for LGBTQ Awareness Month. Um, the month has basically seen a number of pieces by uh, by, by uh, LGBT writers um, or about LGBT writing, themes in, the themes in horror and so on and so forth. But James also suggested that um, some writers who weren't part of the LGBTQ community um, should write something as well for the month uh, as allies um, of the community and to you know, address LGBT themes in their fiction. So this has been my attempt at it. Um, I think it's a piece that lends itself very well to being read aloud. Um, so by way of sort of hoping to signal boost, I'm uh, giving a little performance here. So the story is called As the Crow Flies. And uh, thank you very much, Jim McLeod, for um, asking me to contribute and thank you very much to James Bennett for coming up with the idea. Let's understand one another from the start, shall we? I am not a role model. No one would have even understood the term when I was, al I was alive. I was an acid-tongued bitch, low-born as those cuntish peers never ceased to remind me, and yes, power and status went to my head. Mayor Maxima Culpa, chop my head off for it. Oh no, wait. Guy de Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick, already did that at Blacklow Hill on 19th of June, 1312. Prick. Yes, I am still pissed off about it. Can you tell? Confused? Don't worry, darlings. All will come clear, or should. I'll do my best to fill you in. No, not in that sense, sorry, while I'm waiting. Though you will excuse me if I have to cut things short, won't you? I'm a little pushed for time, which is not something I ever expected to say again, I can tell you. But needs must. So, no, I am not a role model or a queer martyr. I'm nothing more nor less than Piers Gaveston, a brash young queen who did a lot better than he had any right to expect, and paid the price, not least because I couldn't keep my mouth shut around my so-called betters. I wasn't just buggering the king. I couldn't even be discreet about it. But it's not as though they hid their contempt of me. I was a sodomite and a pleb. I don't know which they hated more. I was hardly a peasant, my father was a Gascon knight, but I might as well have lived in a wattle and daub hovel, eaten raw water bowls, and lost my virginity to a sheep, as far as Warwick or his friend Thomas of fucking Lancaster were concerned. So I gave as good as I got. I could be uh, royally, no pun intended, vicious when I wanted to. I used to call Warwick the Black Dog of Arden. I'm sure I could have come up with worse, but for some reason that nickname enraged him. Lancaster was the fiddler, trust me, you don't want to know, and the Earl of Lincoln burst belly. Such a charmer I was, mais je ne regrette rien. Well, with the possible exception of calling the Earl of Pembroke Joseph the Jew. <sighs> what can I say? It was a less enlightened time. And Pembroke, as it turned out, wasn't such a bad sort. But I digress. My royal lover... King Edward II of England, or as he was to me, a lovely med, wasn't fit for any pedestal you might intend to prop him on either. He was, if the ugly truth be told, a terrible king. His father had bullied him all his life. He wasn't enough of a man's man for old Edward Longshanks, and had exiled me before he died. Now, as the boys saw it, he could do his own damned thing, and he did. He summoned me home and created me Earl of Cornwall practically on the spot, and that was when the trouble really started with the peers. The angrier they got, the more he gave me. Yes, he acted like a spoilt adolescent half the time, and yes, it went to my head and I took advantage, got gifts and advancement not only for myself, but for my cronies too. In hindsight, it's no wonder things didn't end well. Nonetheless, he was my love. No two ways about it. And you can say many things about me. I loved deeply, and I loved truly. But I must, for the moment, break off. After seven hundred years in the ground, company's coming.
The crow arched down over the grounds of the school. While crows are intelligent birds, it could not have explained why it had been drawn there, nor why a particular patch of grass on the playing field called to it, yet down it swooped and alighted. Puzzled as to its own choice, the crow, on the assumption some instinct for food had guided it, began to peck at the earth, at which point something moved in, or more accurately, through the earth itself. Dust. Fine grains of powdered bone. The indigestible, the irreducible, the last corporeal traces of Piers Gaveston, Knight of the Realm and Inter Alia, First Earl of Cornwall, Lord Governor of the Isle of Man, and one time quite successful Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, gathered up and motivated by his will, shot from the grassy earth in an animate stream into our crow's open beak and compacted itself in its gizzard. The immortal part of Gaveston leapfrogged from its dust into the crow's spinal column and scrambled as up a ladder into the corvid's small but very capable brain, where it proceeded, metaphorically you understand, to elbow the pilot out of the cockpit, shut the doors and grapple with the controls. Oh, good grief. Zoom's a lack and really fuck this for a lot. Look, would you please just quiet down there, Mr. Crow? I'm very sorry to use you thus, but it's a matter of sad necessity. All I require is transport, nothing more. How far? A short distance only. Our current location is Kings Langley in Hertfordshire, and our destination, Gloucester Cathedral. In a straight line, that's <laughs> as the crow flies, <laughs> uh, that's just uh, under a hundred miles. You can do that in one day. After that, whither thou wilt, go thou mayest. You'll have brought me when I've needed to go for so long. Please. That's not an unreasonable request, surely. Yet I apologise in the manner in which I've come aboard, so to speak, but I'm rather new to this. Thank you, Mr Crow. Mrs Crow is a lucky woman indeed. Or perhaps there's another Mr Crow I'm given to understand that such things occurred in the animal kingdom as in the human one. No? Well, no offence meant, uh, or, nor taken, I hope. No? Good. Gloucester, then. A schoolboy gazing from his classroom window, spotted a crow on the playing field that was behaving somewhat erratically, leaping to and fro and flapping its wings, then falling on its side and beating one wing forlornly at the air. It occurred to him that he was witnessing the avian equivalent of a grand mal seizure. Uh, one of his classmates was a sufferer of epilepsy, which would have earned him an exorcism in Gaveston's time. And being that type of boy who derives enjoyment from separating flies from their wings, watched with some avidity in the hope of seeing the bird die. He was much disappointed. Instead, the crow folded its wings to its body, then stood up once more, smoothing its ruffled breast feathers with its beak. Following one or two experimental flaps of its wings, by which it established that all relevant moving parts were in working order, it launched itself into the air, rose and circled above the school, and then set off to the west-northwest, in the general direction of Gloucester. Before leaving, however, the crow took the opportunity to lighten itself for the journey by unloading a substantial quantity of ballast, which would have got the young sadist smack in the eye had the weather been warmer and the window open. Sadly, it is in chill November that we lay our scene, so the flying turd instead splattered quite loudly and spectacularly against the classroom window. On the plus side, it did cause the boy to start, attracting his teacher's attention and leading to an almighty bollocking for failing to pay attention in class. Which frankly served the little fucker right. We weren't exclusive, of course, lovely Ned and I. Well, we couldn't be, could we? He was married and so was I, since appearances had to be maintained, alliances formed and heirs produced. You could say I had to close my eyes and think of England. And yes, there were other men for both of us. We were often separated by distance. I was exiled three times, once by Ned's father, the old king, and twice by those fucking peers. When we were apart, we took what comfort we might where we could. Our exclusivity was one of soul. Neither of us truly had any other love. In retrospect, I feel rather sorry for Isabella, his queen. No surprise she ended up playing hide the sausage with Baron Mortimer. We'd all have been happy had we lived in the present day, I suspect, and if Edward had been born a few notches down the social scale, without all the requirements of kingship being foisted on him. I can see us running an antique shop in the Cotswolds, 
Well, Isabella went off and found herself a nice straight boy. They do exist, I'm told, at least when sober. But it was a different time. When I came back to England that last time, I was excommunicated outright, and I had to hold Scarborough against a siege by the barons. I was no mean soldier, so I toughed it out at first, but in the end we couldn't hold. The Earl of Pembroke guaranteed my safety if I surrendered, but that prick Warwick snatched me from Pembroke's custody. The black dog of Arden hauled me up in front of a kangaroo court, headed up by him in Lancaster, and then had two Welshmen take me out to Blacklow Hill. One drove a sword through my heart, and the other took my head off. There's probably a joke about getting shafted and or getting head in there somewhere. Pembroke, uh, who was born to protect me, remember, was so angry he switched allegiance to the king. Like I said, he wasn't such a bad sort in the end. As for Warwick, the black dog of Arden was dead within three years. Poisoned, rumour had it. Who ever could have done such a thing? After I was gone, Edward went looking for a new favourite. Easy enough for him to close his eyes and imagine it was me, I suppose. His preference was always for the passive role. Which I didn't begrudge him, but the Lord knows there were times when I could have used a good reaming myself. Luckily, there was never a shortage of rough trade, especially in the port towns, but I digress once more. You might say he needed someone to fill a hole. In his life, I mean. But, and what the fuck were you thinking of, Ned? He ended up with a prize cunt called Hewler Dispenser, and that was when it all went really tits up. Dispenser was a nasty, crooked, greedy little prick, and I say that as someone who hadn't been averse to exploiting my connections to the hilt. The peers hated Dispenser even more than they had me, and it broke out into civil war. The barons lost that one, and it was uh, Thomas the Fiddler of Lancaster's turn to face a kangaroo court and the trip to the block what goes around, etc. But that was the beginning of the end. Ned became an absolute monarch, wrapped around Dispenser's little fucking finger. While he'd never been a marvellous king, now he became an actual tyrant. Glad that he was still the love of my life. And now, the love of my death. There was another civil war. Dispenser got his just desserts at last, hung, drawn and quartered, and her right. Isabella and her boyfriend Mortimer deposed Edward and, if you believe the stories, had him buggered to death with a red-hot poker. It passed for a perfect murder back then, as there was no blood or outward sign of violence, other than some singeing to the royal ring piece, presumably. You don't need Sigmund fucking Freud to spot the symbolism there. So this is Gloucester, is it? Things have changed a little, but then it's been a while. All right, Mr. Crow, just hold thy horses a little longer. We're nearly there. Need only to find the cathedral. You wouldn't think that would be hard to spot from the air. It took three years to bury me. God alone knows what state my mortal remains would in by the time they put them in the ground. I can't clarify the picture, unfortunately. I was pretty disorientated the first four or five years. My death had been a bit of a traumatic event, after all. I died excommunicate, so Edward had to get papal absolution for me in order to arrange a proper burial. He'd found, he'd found a, a Dominican priory at King's Langley in 1308, and interred me there with all ceremony. Good luck finding the tomb now, of course. The priory's long gone, with the only surviving building converted into a school. I ended up under the playing field, being woken up on Thursday afternoons by screaming teenagers trampling over my resting place playing hockey. Sick transit Gloria Monday indeed. And such was my ending. Until now, obviously, where I find myself airborne over Gloucester. I have no idea if my experience of the afterlife is typical. Basically, I regained an increasingly less scrambled sense of awareness in my coffin, and pieced together events in the outside world from eavesdropping on the friars. Since then, there's been a lot of traffic through the area. Now and again, with a lot of effort, I can get out of here over short distances, and briefly connect with the neural systems of animals or occasionally humans, which is why I'm not addressing you in Norman French. I've done my best to remain au courant. If there's a heaven or a hell, I've encountered no evidence of either. I'm aware and conscious in the ground, but that's it. It does get rather boring, which, given how much I loathe tedium, might mean hell after all. 
I did my best to divert myself, retreating into fond memories and pleasurable fantasies. Maybe that's how most people spend their eternities. I whiled away a century or three in such a fashion, but I grew restless and discontent because I wasn't with him. I couldn't wander far, but I was able to poke out above ground and listen in, and pick up enough about the state of the world from those passing by. Hearing about Edward's death was not a pleasant moment, or his interment. I suppose I'd hoped that in death we might at least be together without interference or interruption, but no. Gloucester Cathedral, a hundred miles, might as well have been in China. But where there's a will, there's a way. I was determined to find my way there. I reached that resolution a century ago, and ever since then I've been storing up my energies for the task, for the job of hijacking some transport apologies again, Mr. Crow, and breaking free of the pull of my grave. It's rather like gravity for a space rocket. Till now, at last, here I am. Descend, Mr. Crow, and let the reunion commence. Ah, patient yourself a while, Monsieur Crow. Yes, I know I said our ways would part at Gloucester, and that we're there, but I must be closer to the tomb. Then I can uh, jump ship, as it were, and my dust seep into his casket and peck his bones. And so we shall be reunited, and make love again in whatever fashion the spirits may. The main problem, and I really should have considered this before, is getting inside the bloody cathedral. Finding a way in will be the most difficult part. Very well. Flap my wings, Monsieur Le Corbeau, and alight above the main door. When it opens... Et voila! Quick, quick, before it swings closed behind yon fat, fat American tourist! With a metallic clatter of its wings, the crow came swooping and soaring down the cathedral's central aisle, startling hell out of the congregation, gathered for a special service held by the Bishop of Gloucester. The Reverend Ludwig Zimjana, a young priest of the Anglican Communion from Zimbabwe, turned at the sound of its entry and found the bird hurtling towards his face, ducking only just in time. The crow hurtled on, banked and burned, cawing so ferociously as assorted representatives of the Church of England and the Gloucester Tourist Board converged on it that Ludwig, his late beloved father, had had a great fondness for European classical music, Beethoven in particular, was briefly led to wonder whether this was an attempt on Satan's part to invade the house of God. However, he was fairly certain that Satan would have taken a slightly more terrifying form, although the crow in truth was intimidating enough, and that he would have shut upon the bishop's head rather than that of the local councillor, whom the reverend was fairly sure he'd heard mutter a disparaging remark about his race when his back was turned. The good father reproached himself inwardly for his lack of Christian charity, as he struggled in vain to repress his laughter at the sight. Despite all efforts to catch or shoe it, it conducted a peripatetic tour of the cathedral, from tomb to tomb before finally alighting on the only one belonging to a former king of England, when it perched, eyeing all who dared come near with a defiant glower, then opened its beak and loudly cawed. Then it coughed, or at least made some sound that prefaced an expulsion from its open bill. A dull-coloured dust cascaded forth, or so it seemed, whereon the crow, after teetering for a moment and looking as though it might fall, Top flight and hurtled towards the main doors, which Ludwig had had the presence of mind to run to and open. With the last call, the crow departed, soaring out of the door into the approaching dusk, home presumably to Mrs. Crow, with a tale to tell, and at any rate, out of this story. Ludwig Zimjana closed the cathedral door, and by way of penance for his uncharitable thoughts, made a gift of his handkerchief to the Shatterbond councillor. Before he went home, he inspected the tomb of King Edward II, where the crow had perched, curious about the powdery detritus the bird had seemed to cough up, but found no trace of it. By the time he'd come home to his boyfriend, he dismissed it as a figment of his imagination. The dust, of course, had been the corporeal remnants of Piers Gaveston, ejected from the crow's gizzard after having been repossessed by Gaveston's consciousness. Said consciousness arrested the dust's descent and dispersal, whirling in a tiny but intense dust storm that went unnoticed due to a rather irate crow regaining full possession of its physical faculties in the middle of the cathedral. The storm battered without avail against the tomb, and Gaveston might well have been about to rail at cruel sardonic fate for balking for here at the last. But then the swirling dust detected the tiniest of cracks in the wall of the tomb, imperfectly mended, and so gained access, and the dust of Pierce Gaveston, at last, poured into the tomb of his beloved Edward, and they were reunited after being parted for so long. Except, unfortunately, they weren't. Ned! Oh, lovely Ned!
"'Tis I, my love. What? Jesus Christ, what the bloody hell are you? What? Edward, it's me, Pierce. Pierce who? Oh, wait, you're that Abaston, aren't you? Who the hell are you? You most certainly aren't my Edward. No, I'm not your bloody Edward. Well spotted. But where is he? And what are you doing in his tomb? I've no idea where he is, or where he ended up. What I'm doing in his tomb is taking his place, obviously. Why isn't he here? Because he wasn't bloody dead, you pillock. You're not very quick on the uptake, are you? You're decidedly lacking in respect for your betters, my lad. I like that in a man. I can't say I'm particularly bothered what you like, fella. Obviously not. Well, I see. You crying? Of course I'm not. I can't. I don't have any tear ducts. Oh, yes. Of course not. But if I did, I probably would be. Sorry. Not your fault. So, um, how did you come to end up here? Rough trade, wasn't they? They got me up to Barclay Castle where they were keeping him to satisfy his, you know, his carnal needs. I thought he was supposed to have been horribly ill-treated there. Well, he was at first, but then there was a change of plan. Mortimer wanted him dead, but the que that queen of his turned soft at the end, decided to fake his death and pack him off to the continent as a monk. That was nice of them. Not for bloody me, it wasn't. They needed a body. So, you know, two birds, one stone. Your Edward got his oats, and then after he was gone... Did they... I mean, you know, the story about the red-hot poker. Yes! The bastards bloody fucking well did. It was not fun. Well, no, I imagine it wouldn't be. Are you Welsh, by the way? Yes, I'm Welsh. Are we going to have problems about that now? Of course not. This is the 21st century. I've learned a few things over the years. I'm glad to hear it. But you're a bit of away from home. Well, they couldn't just have anybody, could they? They needed somebody who wouldn't be missed, but who could, they could pass off as Edward. They told me I was to be his companion, you know. <clears throat> He'd be living a fairly pampered life, like a bird in a gilded cage. And I'd be one of the, uh, you know, the creature comforts. Well provided for, a pension. Instead, I got royally shafted, in every sense. Oh dear, I am sorry. Such is life. So it would seem. I'm sorry, I didn't even ask your name. Yanto. Piers. There were always stories that Ned's death was faked, that he ended up in Holland or Italy or the Holy Roman Empire as a monk or something. And I'd always wanted to believe them, but never could. I know this wicked world. A poker up the arse is, as a general rule, always far more likely than a last-minute change of heart. I'd always assumed that the stories were somebody's wishful thinking. And it's nice, yes, to know that my Edward didn't die the horrible, squalid death that history ascribes to him. That I can hope he lived a long and happy life, and died a quiet, peaceful death. <clears throat> but it also means that in death, as in life, we're apart. It took me a hundred years to find the strength to get to Gloucester. Never mind Holland or Central Europe, and where would I even begin to look? There's the tomb, the grave. Perhaps this, at last, is hell. Or, perhaps not. So, Yanto. Yes? It looks as though I may be here for some time. This is my tomb, you know. Technically, it's Edward's. Bugger Edward. I did. Repeatedly. So did I. Oh, yes, so you did. He kept calling me bloody peers throughout. Did he? Well, of 
course he did. He loved you. I loved him. All right, you can stay. I mean, it's a pretty nice tomb, really. A lot nicer than I'd have had otherwise. And I suppose that is partly, sort of, thanks to you. Much appreciated, although, of course, I'd be happy to pay my way in kind. <clears throat> is that even possible? I mean, now that we're spirits or whatever the hell we are. Well, there's one way to find out. True. It'll pass the time, I suppose. What about your beloved Edward? I told you, we were never exclusive in that sense. Any port in a storm. Cheeky. You know, Ianta? What? This could be the start of a beautiful friendship. Don't push it. Thank you.